Some of the content in this recording may be distressing for some audiences. There are links available for Monash Health Services in the description. I wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations, on whose land we are gathered today. I pay my respects to Elders past and present. Today's special guest for PhD Roar is Dr Chris Voisey from the School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment. Welcome Chris, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah, uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow, uh, like you said, School of VAE. Um, I study um, orogenic gold deposits mostly, but I'm an ore deposit geologist, um, mostly doing things with geochemistry, electrical chemistry, nanoparticle science, and a bit of structural geology trying to link those together to try to solve questions that we have outstanding about gold deposits and how they form and how we can find them better. So we, so today's um, podcast is really going to be about your experiences, okay. not only as a PhD student, but your journey um, to getting there as well, which is, I would describe it as unconventional. You probably think it is as completely normal. So I'm, what I'm going to do is start with um, you kind of unpacking that that journey towards your PhD, and then we'll we'll cut in and and talk about the PhD as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it could be unconventional. It's the only one I know. Um, but you want to start at like high school? Yes, please. Or, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, <laughs> uh, below average high school student. Um, I I just didn't find it interesting, like at, at all. I also have a problem with people telling me what to do. So, <laughs> you know, when a, when a teacher's like, oh, you got to learn algebra now, do it. It's important. I'm just like, no, not doing that. So um, I spent all my time talking to people. So I used to get like moved around the classroom. Like I'd talk next to whoever I landed next to. And eventually they'd move me into like my own corner with no one around. And I'd just fall asleep. <laughs> and uh, that's actually how I started drinking coffee. Uh, I, my mom got a, a phone call from my math teacher being like, if Chris won't stay awake, just keep him home because I'm not having him in my class like that. So in the morning, mom would sit a cup of like black coffee in front of me to like, drink that before we go. Like you got to have that in you before I get my car keys. And uh yeah, that's how I started drinking coffee. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, from that, I just, I just didn't do really well. I didn't care. Um, wasn't really interested at all. So I, I finished. Uh, I, was, I was failing math. Uh, I ended up having to do a, um, like an extra credit course. They call, they call it bridging, where your marks are like not great, but not a super bomb. So you don't have to repeat a year of high school, but you definitely got to do something to make up for it. So I did that. Um, after that, I became, uh, I was hired as a dishwasher in a restaurant <laughs> when I was like 17 and then worked my way up to line cook. I, I did that until I was about like 22 and I was, I was really keen on cooking. Like that job was super fun. I think anyone who worked in like the restaurant or hospitality at like that age, like if you're late teens, early twenties, everyone knows it's a lot of fun. Uh, the longevity of it, maybe not for everybody, but, uh, I wanted to go to cooking school. I remember I was talking to my, my kitchen manager. And he was like, hey, man, look, like you're passionate about cooking. That's good. If you want to do it, like no one's going to stop you. But uh, like I'll let you know, you know, I have 30 years experience and I don't get to see my family enough. I'm doing 50, 60 hour weeks. I got no like medical coverage, no retirement fund kind of thing. And he's like, I make like, you know, three or four dollars an hour more than you do. He's like, so do you want to put in that effort and put your life to towards that for, you know, not really a lot of gain? So I was like, all right, well guess I'll go to school and sort something out right so I went to, I went to university after that uh, decided I wanted to be a physicist for some reason uh, I think the reason why is because I, I like knowing I'd like to know how stuff works and I always have so even though I was a poor student I was still a curious person so I, I did want to know how stuff worked and physics was all right because like at least at the rudimentary level it'd be something like hey you throw a ball in there and catch it like describe how it moved and you're like cool I could picture it. that that's that's fine and then uh turns out I'm terrible at math <laughs> so I did I did okay with like learning physical concepts I did not do good with showing like show and prove at math like I was really bad at that and uh so I I was doing a course called computational mechanics where you had to program a uh, like a math program you had to feed it codes so that it could solve problems for you and I had to do this as a midterm and I'll never forget it. And the professor at the time has also never forgotten it because he tells this story apparently. But I, I had to work out the, uh, the frequency of a pendulum hanging off another pendulum that were both made of springs. So you imagine the things like 
going up and, up and down like that. And then there's another one hanging out, but doing the same. And I was just trying to code it. Big C of red. No idea what's going on. Like, don't know. I probably put a backslash where there should have been a forward slash. Anyone out there listening to this who knows how to code is probably like, this, this guy's a moron and laughing at me. But uh, I couldn't do it. And I realized I stood up, I slammed the laptop, and I was like, if this is what physicists do. I'm not going to be a physicist. And I like stormed out. And the press was like, whoa, what's with this kid? <laughs> I, uh, so I went and grabbed a, a coffee and some lunch with my buddy, who uh, at the time was doing geology. I never heard of it. Didn't learn it in school. Didn't know what geology really was. I knew it was rocks. I thought they were like stamp collectors. I didn't think it was actually like useful. And he was doing a... He was doing something where he had to try to like drill a gold deposit or whatever. And I'm like, what, why are you doing that? Is you, are you an engineer or something? And he goes, no, geology, man. It's like, what, what is geology? Like, what do you do? And he's like, where do you think the world's resources come from? And I'm like, I don't know. I just thought like engineers did. He's like, no, geologists do it. So I, I just, you know, quit my major and needed something to do. So I was like, I guess I'll try geology out. Uh, gave it a go. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was uh, everything from like, you know, just being handed mineral samples and being like, hey, identify it. Like, how do you know? Like, I, I think the visual learning I was really, I was really into. Because like I said, I like physics because I can picture what they were describing. I just couldn't do the math for it. But when it came to geology, you'd be like, hey, man, like, you know, at least at beginning rudimentary level, they go, hey, how do you identify pyrite? Or, you know, how do you identify this rock? Something. And it was just all visual and it was cool. And like the information you could pull out, out of it sounded cool. Like, well, what's not cool about like earthquakes? volcanoes you know this rock's 400 million years old and we know that it came from you know africa because this piece broke off that piece like i just thought it was a cool thing i still do and so, so did you jump straight out of physics into geology or was there oh, some sort of gap or i, I hard bailed i i hard bailed i was doing a, i was doing a, an ode course so uh, ordinary differential equations that got dropped I did. Uh, I was doing uh, computational mechanics. That was gone. Well, that was gone as soon as I stormed out of the exam. I, uh, I, I hardcore dipped on all of it. I did end up getting a math and physics minor because I did so much of it before I quit. Uh, now all the marks are like 50s. Like the ones I didn't fail, they're all like 53 and stuff. I wasn't good. That's, that's pretty funny because I, I, my, my physics experience, and people think I'm a geophysicist and I'm so not, but... Um, <laughs> was when I did first year physics at Monash, I got 40, 48%. And, and I got the letter that said, if you never come back to this department, we'll pass you through to second year. And uh, so that was called a P2 in those days. So I did, I cut my ties with physics completely at that time. And, and, then, and then completely focused on geology so. So, so wait they're like as long as you never come back yeah, we'll give yeah, you a we, 50 we will never see you again we'll be happy we'll give you 50 if you go away what did you do like other than get a 48 what do you do to get that kind of letter <laughs> what did i do to get that grade or <laughs> no but i mean like yeah a student getting four if i have a student uh, well, get a 48 i wouldn't be like i'd never want to see your face again oh uh, yeah i uh, look you know i was happy i didn't want to do it so i was happy to move on sideways yeah. and 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 i i, I and geology was my thing as well. So I kind of had already decided that I was really into the, into the earth sciences. So how'd so. you find it? Because like I never had earth science in high school. Like I didn't know what it was until I had coffee with my buddies. So like how'd you find geology? Uh, well, I found it in, in a weird way. Um, so when I was doing high school, well, there was this um, computer system that was kind of called BBC. And it's like it's, it doesn't exist anymore. And you could ask... That's a, that's a system that our school had. Anyway, it had this survey, not, not the system, but on this system, it basically said, you know, if you t answer these 100 questions, that would tell you what careers were suitable for you. So I answered the 100 questions and it spat out three, which is surveyor, geophysicist, geologist. And, um, and I'd done surveying the year before as a sort of work experience and it sucked and I was <laughs> terrible at it. <laughs> Is that like you know, I was like holding a stop flat. sign like this, right? It was, that was my work experience. Oh, you know, So brain dead, right? Anyway, so so off to uni, I went to so do the geology thing, right? You were a lollipop man? Yeah, so, yeah, pretty much. They make a killing, though. Yeah, not those days. <laughs> I was $2 an hour work experience, 1987. Anyway, I was, this is not about me, So, but I, but I kind of get that when you find something that you're really passionate about, you become really good at it. So, and you, yeah. so if we wind back to your... Um, your uni days in undergraduate yeah. where did you go to university oh dude yeah. memorial university in newfoundland that's uh that's where i'm from i'm, I'm a newfie from mount pearl for the nobody out there who knows where that is 
Um, but they have, they have an outstanding undergraduate in geology, an outstanding one. It's uh, like, I know when we're going for jobs in Canada as an undergrad, like when you're going to get like vac work stuff, they, a lot of people preferentially hire out of Memorial because it's, um, it's, it's just a really, they have a really strong faculty program, whatever, but also Newfoundland itself has been, um, it's been recently glaciated. So there's a lot of hard rock everywhere. Like people build houses on hard rock. So if you compare that to a place like Australia, where there's a lot of cover, like overburdened sands and things like I can walk on like a vein or a fault or whatever and follow it until I get bored. Like the it's so easy to learn geology there as well, because the outcrops are so amazing. So our, our students do really well. But that, that's where I did my undergrad. And it was it was awesome. Um, it was so good. I think the reason why it was so good is that everyone who did it thought it was cool. And I think that made it really easy for me to like, like pursue that passion. So like, I, th I thought it was really cool because I was like, this is an interesting topic of science. Like I found it more interesting than, you know, doing titrations in chemistry or uh, obviously yeah, finding the frequency of pendulums. Um, but I thought it was pretty cool as a science. And then everyone around me also thought it was really cool. So when you got this like pack mentality where people are not only interested in, in this thing that you're interested in, but like they couldn't get enough. So when we had guest lecturers and stuff come in, the room would be packed. Like people would like work their day around it. They'd be like, oh, I, I told work, I'm going to be an hour late to go in because this guy's going to come in and talk about crystallography or something. So everyone thought it was cool, which made it a lot easier for me to feel cool by also thinking it's cool. So it was, it was a really great place to do it. I, I had an awesome time. Like I, I'm willing to say undergraduate doing geology were the best years. Like really great. So you kind of jump from, I don't want to say, I don't want to say high school dropout, but it's <laughs> someone who's struggled a little bit through high school yeah. and then suddenly you found your thing, yep. geology, geosciences, let's call it that. Yep. And, and you found your tribe. Is that, is that a good way to describe yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Uh, yeah, it yeah. was a bit primal. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and so once you found that tribe, you then, did you go and work or did you go and jump straight into sort of um, research PhD? Um, no, I, I, I worked throughout. So I, um, I had in the, in my, for like my VAC work, I worked with the geological survey in Newfoundland um, and I had various jobs with them. So I did, um, I did a lab job the first time. So I was just crushing rocks and, you know, getting stuff ready for, uh, for ICPMS analysis. So like mass spectrometry chemistry stuff. And then the following summer I was doing um, helicopter work. I was doing lake sediment sampling. So you fly around in a helicopter all day and you like land on a lake and you basically get like a hollow metal tube that you throw to the bottom of a lake and when you pull it up it's full of like mud so that's like the lake sediment and you put that in a bag and then you take off and you land in the next lake so i spent a summer in labrador um just like dive bombing up and down in a helicopter all day uh which was cool i'm, I'm afraid of heights so it, it took me a minute to get used to it and i almost fell out of it twice because <laughs> me and uh, me and my supervisor at the time we were seeing who could get more samples in a day and I was like, you know, we had an option when we first got the helicopter. They're like, look, we can either take the doors off and you got to make sure you got your seatbelt on tight all the time or we can leave the doors on, you know. And I was like, all right, well, I'll save a lot of time by not having a seatbelt, you know, because the, the doors are on, right? We're safe. But the door is actually really tricky to close sometimes. <laughs> so I was twice I had this happen where I thought I closed the door and the helicopter would do like a sharp dive and the door just flew open i had no seatbelt on i was just holding on to like the handle like you'd have in a car like up yeah. by your head and i'm like looking down at just like the forest <laughs> and i grabbed the door and closed it and the the helicopter pilot was like oh geez boys you know usually when that happens to people they really freak out but like you know good thing you got your seatbelt on or whatever and i was like yeah good thing man <laughs> just not on <laughs> but uh uh yeah everyone should be safer than i am but uh yeah i did that for a summer and then the third summer i worked with um uh, this really, this really awesome geo name, Hamish Sandeman. Um, he, he did uh, gold deposit stuff um, in Newfoundland. So we used to go to uh, gold, uh, actual working gold mines, uh, gold deposits, prospects, claims, whatever. And we just did a lot of sampling and map, uh, mapping and like describing the areas and stuff. And like, you know, general like, um, you know, description, like look and see geology of gold deposits. Uh, and that, that was, that was great. Um, during the semesters, I worked in an SEM lab. So like, during the semester, I'd have two jobs working in SEM labs. I used to just make epoxy pucks and cruise around on an electron microscope. So I did a lot of work during my undergrad and got like a good feel for, you know, the various things, right? Like laboratories, analytical laboratories, field work, um, mapping. And 
I, I did an honors after that. And I thought research science was cool. I got like a buzz off it. Like when I wrote my honors, I was like pinging off the excitement of like making a new piece of science that no one's done before. Uh, I think the first one you do always feels really great. Like your first dip into it, you're like, you know, this is my identity. This is awesome. And I, I, I decided I really like research. I wanted to be a research scientist. So I, that's how I decided to, to do a PhD after so you, that. So you did your PhD at, here at Monash. Yeah. How did, how did, you, how did, you, how did you land here? Um, what was your process? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and what was your project, I guess? Let's, let's start uh, there and then we can, we, we'll explore that a bit more. I think my supervisor won't appreciate this answer at first, but I've told him this before, Andy. Um, when I was deciding where to go for a PhD, uh, well, first I wanted to stay in Newfoundland because that's where I'm from. I had friends and family and my life was really awesome there. And the, my, my supervisors there were like, hey man, if you're serious about being a research scientist, like you, you gotta go. They're basically like, you gotta leave. They're like, you, you know, we're happy to take you here for like a master's or something, but like if you're serious about wanting to be a research geologist, you got to travel, you know, they're like, you got to learn techniques from other people that we don't have here. They, they basically said, if you, if you stay a memorial and you only learn memorial stuff, you're not bringing anything to the table. So they're like, go somewhere else, man, like have fun somewhere else. So I was like, all right, if I'm going to go somewhere, I'm going to go really far. So I was like, if I'm not going to be like, to me, if I'm not home in Newfoundland, like I might as well be anywhere else in the world. So I wasn't going to go somewhere else in Canada. It wasn't adventurous enough, I guess. I was like, if I'm going, I'm going. So because of that, I was like, I got to go to a different country. And I Googled funnest cities to live in <laughs> melbourne was number one <laughs> so, so i was like what universities are there man so there's melbourne uni there's monash uni uh, then i wanted someone who's studying uh like ore deposits i wanted to do uh, something to do with ore deposits and i i particularly like gold deposits because i was working with hamish and i had that bit of experience and um yeah and andy Tompkins is uh was my supervisor and is currently my supervisor for a postdoc uh and he's uh i didn't know it at the time but he's actually a very impressive gold deposit scientist to me he was just a dude with a project in the fun city and then i realized after i was like oh man this guy's actually like a classist in the field i just didn't know <laughs> so i kind of lucked into getting a fantastic supervisor but i was really just looking to have fun dude i was 25 you know if you if you can give someone a ticket like a 25 year old and be like where do you want to go for your career they're going to pick the fun place so i picked the well, fun place. well they should i i think so anyway i yeah. won't tell you my my reasons for doing a phd were completely nothing to do with my project, I was 100% motivated after my honours year to loop back into Melbourne to be with my girlfriend. That was my motivation. Lame. They're terrible, eh? <laughs> Lame. I, I, I actually... Who's I, my ex-wife, by the way? <laughs> Rip. <laughs> we probably will edit that one out. But anyway. See you later. Yeah, yeah so. no, I, I dipped on everyone. I hardcore dipped. Like, I, I had a partner, had a car, like, you know, friends, family and stuff. And I was basically just like, my life's really fun here. It's probably going to be really fun over there, too. Um, I just thought everywhere was great. So I, I just, I left. And, and were you grateful? Like, when I, so, so were you grateful to get a project or you kind of just assumed because you were, you had good grades that you, in geology that you'd get um, it or? I, it was, it was a bit of both. Like in retrospect, I'm super grateful to get a project, like not only the one that I did, but also with Andy, like it was because in retrospect, I'm like, I had a fantastic experience, especially when you hear about other people's experiences and PhDs that are not great. Uh, cause a, a lot of people struggle, dude, a lot of people struggle. And I wouldn't say I struggled with the science part. I struggled with the, like the personal life part about moving and stuff. Um, the actual science part, like I, I, great support from my supervisor he gave me freedom to do what i want like everything on the science end was really good moving to the other side of the world by yourself is not uh the easy happy-go-lucky thing i thought it would be so i struggled a lot personally like like my mental health struggled for that um but in retrospect I, i'm really grateful for it at the time when i was applying for projects i i was super picky because i wanted to have I want that field work. Like I wanted, again, I think this came from the Memorial University setting. Like they're very much like grounded in classical geology, I'll say. So like, you know, you're, you're doing field mapping, you're camping out in the bush, you're doing hard rock geology, you got to do petrography, you know, you got to do whole rock geochem. Like they do this like really strong foundations of geology that I didn't, I didn't want to give up. I, I thought that's what good geology was. And a lot of times when you're going for a PhD project, which, you know, it seems obvious now, but wasn't then, 
is that, you know, you got to do new science. So things are either really small or really big and they're often analytical. So when I've seen projects where it was like, hey, come analyze titanite crystals from these parts of the world, I'd be like, is there field work? They'd be like, no, I already had, I got a drawer full of titanite crystals, man, come probe them or something. And I'd be like, that sounds terrible. I'm not doing that. So I, I applied to a lot of places. It wasn't like, you know, my only shot was that with, with Andy. I applied to a lot of places and a lot of the projects were kind of just analytical like that. And I, I turned a lot of them down because I was like, how come no one's doing hard rock mapping? How come no one's doing this stuff? But really, that's actually arcade. That's kind of old science. But at the time, I was like, this is fundamental. Like, you need it. So, um, yeah, I was a little bit picky. But in retrospect, I'm very appreciative. So, so I because I, I was the, well, I was in my role when you were doing your PhD. And I know we had a conversation at one point, mm-hmm. I don't know, I think it's about halfway through, maybe. One maybe, year, not maybe, even, it was 10 months. It was 10 months in, was it? Yeah. So, and you came to me and said, oh, I'm thinking about swapping projects. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so one of the things that Andy does is he does the economic geology side of things, the gold deposits, etc. Yeah. But he's also, you know, one of Australia's leading experts in meteorites. Yep. Do you know what I mean? That's his kind of. His passion, one of his, yeah, it's, it's his, his pa- project, it's, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's his passion project, right? Yeah. And he, and so, um, and and the conversation really was, I'm thinking of jumping out of the economic geology project into yeah. a meteorite project, and that never eventuated. I no. can't even remember the advice I gave you. I, I suspect I would have been, don't do it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was probably, yeah, don't. Uh, which is why. So what happened? What, so what was your thought process when you were going, I've got some doubt about my project and and I'm thinking about, you know, I've only, you know, lost 10 months. I'm swapping into something else that yeah. my supervisor's passionate about. Clearly you were thinking about it. So what made you think that like that to start with? And then what made you not jump in the end, I guess? Uh, that I just want to know the thought process that was you know, bubbling around in yeah. his head. Um, yeah, okay. So it's, um, so as, as I was alluding to earlier, with, for international students, I'll say that this is worse than if you're a domestic student, I'd say. But when you give up your friends, your family, your support network, your home to go pursue science, so like your science project, your PhD project, whatever, um, that's suddenly the only thing you have, which means that anything about it that seems a bit off hits you harder. So as an example, when I was doing my honors back home, I had my supervisor change my project two or three times, which I think for anyone else, they'd be like, this is terrible. Stop changing my project. Like I'm losing so much work. Right. But I, I mean, I had a great friends, family, everything. So he changed my project. I'd be like, whatever, man, I can do anything. You know, it doesn't matter. Like it, did, it didn't phase me. Um, but when I came here, uh, there, there's, there was no other students that were studying ore deposits. So I felt pretty isolated. Like I was the only one doing it. And my PhD at the time was really analytical, like it was doing isotope science, which I'm not great at, <laughs> and I stopped doing. But, um, you know, I was doing something that I, I, I found difficult. I had no sort of comrades to share, like, or deposit passion with, right? So remember, in my undergrad, it was great because everyone thought it was so cool to do this science. And when I came here, everyone's in their own, um, they're in their own lane studying their own PhDs or whatever, and no one else was doing or deposit stuff. So I felt a bit isolated. And then... I went on a meteorite trip with Andy and his, his group, and we went out, and I found a giant meteorite. It was awesome. It's about the, the size of a tin of, like, dull pineapple slices. Um, so I was like, oh, this is exciting. I found a space rock. And then there's a lot of people uh, that, were, that were my friends that I met on the trip who we hung out all the time, and they all did meteorite science. So I seen this cohort of my friends who were all really into meteorite stuff, and I was kind of doing my thing all alone. And then not having, you know, the support I would have had back home, friends, family, whatever. Like, that just really hit hard. Like, it really rocked my boat. I was like, man, I feel really isolated and alone. And anything I was thinking about with my studies, my order deposit stuff, yeah, Andy was there for me for sure. But, you know, it would be nice to have, you know, like other, other PhD students or whatever to, to share that stuff with. I didn't have it. So I just got into this, uh, this rut of being like, maybe I'll switch to meteorites because that's kind of what, like, all my friends are doing. Uh, which is <laughs> similar to my undergrad. And I was like, everyone thinks geology is cool. I'll do that too. Uh, so I, I felt just alone, man. I felt isolated. So I was going to switch. Uh, then after speaking to you, I took a trip home to good old Newfoundland and reunited with all my buddies who all think hard rock geology is cool. And, you know, they were just asking me about my project and stuff. And they're like, man, that's so awesome. Like you're doing such cool stuff. And I even spoke to a few friends about maybe dropping out or rolling into masters i know andy thought i wasn't coming back like there's a lot of people who are like he's going home for christmas there's no way he's getting on the plane to come back but i did and um 
I did. And I was just talking to these friends who were like, dude, you can't quit on this opportunity. Like we all went through undergrad together. Like you've got a scholarship to get paid to do geology, which we know is your favorite thing. And you're like in Australia, you're on the other side of the world. Like this is a fantastic opportunity. So like you feel really, you know, kind of shitty now, but they're like, what you're actually doing, we're all proud of you. And it's actually really impressive. And I think to hear that from, you know, my people, my support network was just reinvigorating. And I came back and told Andy, I was like, no, I'm not switching, don't care, but I'm not doing isotopes anymore. So I did end up changing my project a bit. It was still about gold deposits or whatever. I didn't jump over to meteorites, but I was like, I can't be an analytical lab guy. I was like, I need field work. I need that like fundamental kind of petrography sort of hard rock geology. And he was like, yeah, man, like, I'll let you do whatever you think you'll do best at, which Andy is great for. Like Andy knows if you force someone to do something they don't really love, they probably won't do great. But if you give them the freedom to pursue something they're passionate about, like they'll produce great results. And I really appreciate that he did that for me. And that's kind of what it took. And then once I came back and landed, I was like, all right, no, this is it. Like I'm on board. And I never thought twice. Like it was, I'm so glad I stayed in order to geology. Yeah. So the whole PhD, I actually agree with Andy. It's like, it should be the student's project, not yours as a supervisor. And you're, you're just really handing a little bit of, you know, a smidge of your IP across at the start to say, well, here's something to start with. You and then seed. You take it, ta- yeah, seed it. Yeah, right? And you then you go, take it wherever you like. Um, and usually they follow their nose and then you get, you get a great outcome, especially as, as they develop. So, you know, it's, it's really important in my mind as a supervisor to, to allow the student to grow into their project. And sometimes that takes a little bit longer for some students than others. But, it, but at the end of the day, it pays dividends at the back end of the project because they're so into what they've done because they, they own it. Whereas if you're constantly telling a student what to do, there's no ownership do you know what i mean it's like a, and 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 that lack of ownership means that they'll be less engaged in their project and that's just my my uh, philosophy so yeah well not not only will they be less engaged but you're actually almost robbing them the opportunity to become a scientist so if if someone starts a phd and they go all right my supervisor has this ip he's going to tell me what to do and then let's say every second week or something you meet with your supervisor and he goes oh yes you've done step one this is how you do step two go do it then they come back it's how you do step three go do it before you know it the like that student hasn't really done science what they're they're just an extra hand for their their supervisor so when they finish and it's time for them to invent science it's time for you to go be a scientist they don't know how because their supervisor's actually done it all they just carried out the lab work or the the analyses or the interp whatever it might be but you're robbing them the opportunity to become a free thinking self-supporting scientist uh so you probably advise against that <laughs> i call it do this supervision do this do this do this do this and then come back i wouldn't be able to handle it remember <laughs> no. i said i hate being told what to do if, if yeah. someone tried to do that to me i'd be like no <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough too it's like so so before look thank thank you but we're not finished because i'm going to touch upon uh um, sure. something one thing else um which is you know you've been diagnosed with adhd yeah um you said to me earlier that you're um I didn't know about that until you said it. And then when you said it, I went, oh, yeah, it's obvious, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no offense, of Chris. No, uh, no, no. And so you wear, you wear it with a, um, you know, with a b- bit of a badge, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what's it like being a scientist with ADHD to uh, start with? And uh, this is something that's really passionate me with, in my family because my yeah. son's got it. Yeah, sure. Um, so what's it like to being a scientist and... Um, what are the strategies that you've employed and what are the advantages that it has given you as well? Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd say by and large, it's the best. And um, yeah, don't get uh, discouraged if you're neurodivergent in any way. I think one of the most valuable things that you get from it is that if you think a little bit irregularly in, in any way, uh, chances are you're going to think of something that no one else has thought of, which is almost exactly what science is. Uh, like whether you think of an idea that might not be common or if you make an observation or you see something in your data that might not be common, um, these things are useful. They're, they're helpful. Uh, it doesn't mean you're a superhero, though. Um, there's definitely disadvantages, for, for sure, at least with, um, with, with me. Um, I find that it's exceptionally useful for pursuing ideas, going down rabbit holes. You know, you get distracted by something, and as long as that something is at least like adjacent to your project or your science, it's probably going to be useful. 
uh, like an example for me is I got really interested in nanoparticle science and um, a lot to do with like material science and surface chemistry and whatever. These things aren't normal for geologists to think about. Just for anyone listening, geologists don't normally think about these things, but they are really useful and they can be applied to geology. And it's sort of an emerging field of geology now to talk about uh, nanoparticles, particularly with ore deposits. So for me, I thought it was cool and I dove into it and I ended up publishing my most successful paper based on it. And I would think that was done entirely from going down a, you know, a distracted rabbit hole that was, uh, it's a little mix of basically having a poor attention span and having obsessive behavior. So being like, I can't learn enough about a topic. Now, the reason when this, it, like, this isn't useful is that I do that with everything. So for example, like, I don't know, dude, you watch Game of Thrones, you know, something with a really rich lore. And then I wake up in the morning and instead of finding a piece of science to go down the rabbit hole i'm reading about lore of side characters that like aren't even relevant but i just need to know how they interacted with everyone so unfortunately i don't get to kind of choose what i get obsessed with so i was very fortunate enough that i did it on you know science topics that were useful but you got to reel that in See the professionalism there. I found I, the pause I see, I see in the hand. I see the hand. <laughs> but yeah, you want you want to reel that in. Um, I I so you can give yourself some self discipline. Look, no no one else knows how you think better than you do. So um, for example, like if I know that the one thing I've noticed about myself is the first thing I do in the morning is the thing that I usually obsess over for hours. So if I wake up, cup of coffee, whatever, if the first thing I look at is like social media, I'm diving down a social media hole. The first thing I look at is, you know, some video game stuff or something to do with music or snowboarding, any of my other interests. That's it. I'm watching snowboard videos for five hours, you know, like, so I, I know this about myself. So I make sure that the first thing I do, the first thing I land on is something relevant to my job. So it's, and, and not emails. I'm not diving down emails for five hours. It's not useful, but, uh, you know, I'll dive into some science topic that's I'm interested in and I'll get into it for five hours, get stuck into it. And then in the afternoons, I'm usually slow and easily distracted. So that's when I do things like make figures, answer emails, whatever. So there's patterns that you'll recognize in yourself where you, you know when things are productive and when they're not and when you're getting in a rabbit hole and whatever. But I, I think if you know how to sort of control that or curb it a bit, it's like wildly useful. Like I think it's really advantageous. Like, so you get tighter at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. And that's because you're concentrating. Oh, dude. Did- Concentrating makes you so tired. Yeah. Like if you actually, like, I mean, full blown concentrate for five hours, you, you come out of it and you're like sweaty and thirsty. And you're like, I don't even know if I used the bathroom yet today. Like, like those obsessive, like brain waves, those things like they cripple you. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I, I think we're, we've covered everything off. Thanks for your time. And thanks for your openness and honesty. Of course. I am going to ask a couple of questions that, that everyone gets asked so the first one is you're going through the challenges of doing a phd what what album are you listening to uh uh, i'll advise anyone to listen to uh tism this is serious mom um but uh for anyone who uh has been born in the last three decades uh (laughs) um, i i listened to when i was trying to write my thesis i was listening to um, bluegrass music because it was really fast high tempo um so the guy i listened to was billy strings a really impressive young blues guitarist really good um sorry bluegrass guitarist really fast tempo if you can keep up with his speed while you're typing you'll write a thesis in like i don't know eight days um for, for thinking, um, for like chilling out and trying to think of like good ideas, I would recommend uh, MF Doom, who's a hip hop artist, but unfortunately he died about two years ago. But his album catalog is big and extensive and really good to get your, uh, your brain thinking. So I, I'd, I'd say there's, there's two camps, right? You do one for thinking, listen to MF Doom if you're a hip hop fan. When you need to pump out words per minute, listen to bluegrass music, check out Billy Strings. Excellent. And just to fi- finalize or finish up, yeah. Um, any advice for the current cohort of PhD students? Current cohort of PhD students. Uh, feel free to work from home if you want to. Uh, I know COVID's over, but uh, I think, or at least for me, it's really, uh, it's really advantageous to switch the scenery around you. If you spend every day in your office and you see the same stuff all day, the same things, uh, you'll just have the same thoughts and you won't do anything new and creative. So, uh, you know, feel free to work from home. 
you can get ahead of chores while you're there, you know, it's almost like multitasking, you know, you gain some time, but also just change your scenery. You don't always have to be in your office. Uh, some supervisors might like seeing you crunch a nine to five, but this is your project. It's your creativity. You want to get your brain pumping. So feel free to go to a coffee shop, a pub, your office, your home office, whatever. Change your situation up, change your surroundings up, and you'll start thinking of new thoughts. And I think that's very useful. Fantastic, Chris. That's awesome. Thanks very much, mate. Really yeah, great anytime. to have you on the PhD Raw podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Cheers. Thank you for tuning into today's episode of PhD Raw. We hope you enjoy the insights and valuable advice shared by our distinguished alumni. Their PhD experiences shed light on the diverse and transformational journeys that shape the lives of doctoral students. As you navigate your own academic path, remember to embrace the challenges, celebrate your accomplishments, and value the connections you make along the way. Until next time, keep learning, growing, and making an impact in your field.